we are recording this as well. So let's see if that works. Okay, so, um, so I am also a partner in IDI Ventures, which is our early stage venture capital fund for Pakistan. Um, I am joined by a couple of really amazing panelists today. I'm really excited uh, for who we have, but first I would really love to get a sense of who's in the quote unquote room. If you guys see the uh, raise hand sign on your, uh, on your, on your screen, um, if you can raise your hand if you are in Pakistan right now. That would be great. And we can see a few people. Yay. Um, yes, awesome. Raising hand means on the actual Zoom thing, or you can physically raise your hand as well. Um, if you are in Bangladesh, please raise your hand. We have a bunch of people from Bangladesh as well. Um, if you are in neither of those places and are somewhere in the world, please raise your hand. Great. Um, what I love about this is I think that what COVID-19 has actually done is it's created this opportunity because of technology um, to have these conversations that we may not always have. And so I've been really lucky. Um, I'm my mother is Bangladeshi, my dad is Pakistani, so I've had a pretty unique opportunity to do a lot of work in Bangladesh and with Light Castle Partners, as well as with many other people in Bangladesh so far. Um, while Ida I works in Pakistan, we do work regionally as well, but oftentimes because of the current situation politically, it's really hard for Pakistanis to go to Bangladesh and vice versa. So we thought this could be a really amazing opportunity to talk regionally about our ecosystems and to um, be able to highlight some of the opportunities in the spaces that maybe we're not always thinking about um, when the pandemic isn't happening. Um, so our panelists today are uh, we have Bijan Islam, who is the CEO of Light Castle Partners, and they're one of our amazing partners that's in Bangladesh right now. Um, Umbreen Baig is, heads our research arm at Invest to Innovate. Um, Mani Meyer is the founder of Baikia, um, based in Pakistan. Um, and Tina Jabin is the investment advisor to Startup Bangladesh. You'll be hearing more from each of these people, um, each of these people to, uh, later on in this webinar. Um, but first, what I would love to do is um, why we're doing this. And in the first place. So beyond the fact of having this regional discussion, um, oftentimes when we're talking about COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, everyone is talking about how this is impacting and we're all talking in these grand conjectures. But what we're not actually saying is how, what is the evidence and what is the research that's really backing what the impact of the pandemic is doing to these startup ecosystems. And luckily for you guys, um, our two companies, Light Castle and Eye to Eye, uh, love good research, and we love to actually um, back our back what we do with evidence. And so, uh, both our companies have decided to release research on the impact of. Um, COVID-19 on these ecosystems. And while that's really important, what's it's important is actually the, um, the analysis of that data, as well as how it's really impacting people on the ground. So beyond um, Bijan and Umbreen, who are first going to present the findings from this research, we'll also be opening it up to this panel of amazing people to also talk about how it's impacting, um, how, impacting them on a day-to-day -day basis. How can we zoom out and think about the opportunities here? Um, so really excited for that. Um, I'm going to pass Pass it to um, Umbreen and Bijan to take on um, the presentation of the data that was released. Umbreen, if you wouldn't mind going first, and then Bijan will cover Bangladesh. But Umbreen will be covering um, the impact of COVID-19 on the Pakistan startup space based on a survey that we did and gathered from over 100 companies in the ecosystem. And Light Castle did something similar for Bangladesh. So I'll pass it on to Umbreen. Let me unmute. Hi, everyone. Uh, give me a second while I share my screen so that everyone can see. Can everyone see my screen? Um, so hi to everyone who's uh, listening in. Um, first of all, I, like I said, I'm Green Bay. I had the research arm in, uh, at Invest to Innovate. Um, and the reason why we kind of thought about doing this research was because all of us know that it's a difficult time. Um, and with people staying home and with the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns, a lot of things have changed. Um, you know, the way, really, I mean, you know, the way we know life, right? So it, it has disrupted um, the way we live, the way we uh, learn, the way we, you know, get healthcare services, all of that. 
Um, and we felt like there was a grave need for us to kind of understand how and to what extent were startups being impacted by that. Um, and in doing that, what we did was, you know, from March 22nd, when the lockdown started, um, until we first started uh, conducting or gathering data uh, from the 101 startups that we worked with, um, we kind of tried to capture 30 days worth of impact of, you know, how many start, uh, how different aspects of startups and, you know, the way they were running their businesses were being impacted by the uh, by the pandemic and the uh, lockdowns. So you see, uh, what you see in the report is basically kind of a culmination of all of what you know happened in those 30 days, or even less in some cases, um, because the report was published a week after the data was actually gathered and analyzed. Um, so we had basically surveyed um, 101 startups. Uh, most of them were early stage, some of them were later stage. But the interesting thing was that 49% of the startups that we surveyed, uh, uh, out of the startups that we surveyed, 49% said that they had already suspended services temporarily in Pakistan. Um, so that was kind of, you know, that identified how, um, you know, big the impact was in a way, even if, even when it was, you know, two weeks into the pandemic. Um, so four basic kind of sectors, which included e-commerce, on-demand, tourism, uh, transportation, and mobility. These four sectors uh, accounted for 45% of our sample. Um, and then out of those 45% that, you know, was a part of the sample, 56% said that they had suspended services in these four sectors alone. So that really showed us how, you know, these four sectors were kind of the hardest hit uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and when you look at this chart specifically, you see how, you know, even though with transportation, um, where you see that the impact was 100% in, in the sense that, you know, 100% of the companies had shut down in that sector. Uh, when you see, when you look at the data against on demand, you see that the companies, the number of companies in that sector is much higher than any other sector, uh, than tourism, than transportation. So even though the percentage was low for on demand, the number of companies impacted was actually as, you know, as many as tourism or transportation or even more. Um, so, and these were some of the key companies that were, um, you know, kind of prominent companies that were impacted by the pandemic in the sense that, you know, they were uh, kind of required to suspend services and not all of them we actually included in the survey, but, you know, these are some of the kind of uh, key players in uh, among these startups in each of these sectors. Um, and then another interesting factor that came out of this, another interesting finding that came out was that, you know, even though all of us know that nobody wins in the COVID world, right? So there's no, uh, not really a a positive impact of the pandemic, but at the same time, the kind of circumstances that have been created as a result of the pandemic, um, there's, there has been a lot of opportunities that have been created in certain sectors more than others. So we saw that ed tech, health tech, and e-commerce were some sectors that saw, um, you know, a lot of kind of, you know, uh, opening up, up of opportunities for these startups. Um, you know, these three sectors that accounted for 51% of our total sample size, um, a lot of these companies reported kind of, you know, showing, um, you know, act, getting more users, um, kind of, you know, change in terms of perception and things like that. So, you know, in EdTech, you'll see that, um, you know, players like Sehat Kahani, Grid3D, uh, sorry, uh, EdCasa, Knowledge Platform, and in Telehealth, you'll see Sehat Kahani, and in Essential Services, you'll see people like the Y and Monday Express and people like that. So, you know, a lot of these people kind of saw, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity was created because of the fact that, you know, people were restricted to their homes with a lot of these schools shut down and, you know, the alternatives to these, um, the traditional alternatives to these services or these sectors, uh, the brick and mortar kind of alternatives were kind of, um, you know, access to those services was impeded in one way or another. So that kind of created an opportunity uh, for people in this sector. And then in terms of um, growth plans for startups, which we saw that, um, you know, 52% of our sample reported that they'd postponed expansion plans, 61% reported that they canceled um, scheduled hiring decisions. Uh, but one thing that was interesting was that 69% reported that they had not laid off any people or administered any pay cuts as of, you know, the time that we administered our survey. So that was interesting because, um, I mean, you know, in a way, if you look at it, I think it was early on in the pandemic. So, you know, that might have meant that a lot of people did not really lay off their, um, you know, employees or administered pay cuts early on. But, you know, further kind of, you know, research into, into this could show if it hold, holds up, you know, much deeper into the pandemic. Uh, and also another interesting um, observation was that while people said that they, um, you know, 
did kind of have a lot of trust in the government's capability to, um, you know, manage the outbreak. They did also say that, you know, show that they were not so confident when it came, came to their confidence in um, the government's ability to kind of rescue startups from the impact of the pandemic. So that was again kind of, you know, and it also speaks to the, uh, the stimulus package that has been put out in the recent times, which just doesn't really cater to the, you know, startups um, and the startup ecosystem in general. Um, and as we've seen, um, as we've heard from a lot of experts as well, you know, a lot of pieces have come out of, uh, on this as well, that, you know, uh, at the end of this pandemic, what's going to matter the most is that, you know, survival is what we what we actually need to achieve at the end of this, right? Um, so anything, any adaptability, any iteration in the process that can be done to make sure that we survive, these startups survive uh, through the pandemic is what we need to do right now. And in relation to that, what we saw was that out of the 101 startups that we surveyed, 48% said that they had suspended services. And out of those, 72% said that they had no alternative offering. So that kind of shows how a lot of people who are already kind of, you know, suspending their services, uh, they do not have a lot of, um, you know, revenue coming in and a lot of that. Um, at the same time, they don't really have anything to offer to the market as well, which is again, a huge challenge. Um, and seven major startups that, you know, in terms of uh, the number of startups that they account for in the ecosystem, um, 61 of the startups that we, uh, you know, of the 101 that we uh, surveyed, uh, said that they had lost either, you know, 44% said that they had lost less than a million uh, PKR, or and 32, 33% uh, said that they had lost somewhere from 1 million uh, PKR to 5 million PKR. So you can see that in, in the fact that they're already, they've already suspended services and they have no alternative offering at the same time they're losing revenue. So this makes it even more challenging for startups like that to survive. Um, and some examples of, um, you know, uh, startups in the ecosystem companies that have kind of pivoted their business models or, you know, offered some sort of a solution uh, to be part of the COVID solution are, you know, created uh, grid 3D um, that came out with, you know, 3D printing ventilators. And then we have um, the VAI um, that actually started um, doing PCR based uh, testing for COVID, which has a return time of about 48 hours. And similarly, Conatural and Tello, uh, Conatural has come out with, you know, they're, they've pivoted their manufacturing and they've started producing uh, sanitizers. And Tello has launched a chatbot and a visualizer. So there are companies that are actually pivoting their business models. And if not pivoting their business models completely, they're offering some sort of a solution um, that is, you know, making them part of the solution uh, to the COVID problem. Um, so all of this, uh, looking at what's going on in the ecosystem in terms of startups and how they're doing, that's one thing. But then, you know, other than that, how, you know, all of these reports and all of these analyses from IMF and all of these big players that have come out in the recent times that have showed and pointed to a global recession and a really difficult time. Some have even said that this is going to be, you know, the worst financial crisis in the past 150 years, which is a really big uh, and really kind of challenging situation for every country to be in. So that really means that, you know, as we see, you know, the big economies like the US and, the Ch uh, and China and, you know, other countries uh, face this financial crisis or, you know, it's going to kind of by extension cause a challenge in terms of fundraising for VCs and other investors as well. So that means that, you know, a dearth of financial resources in the future that's going to impact obviously startups in a major way. Um, and also Startup Genome recently um, said that, you know, there's going to be a decline of 86.4 billion in VC fundings globally, billion dollars in VC fundings in the next 12 months only. Uh, and then seed stage funding has been, you know, similarly people have said that it's going to, in Asia especially, it's going to go down. So all of these things obviously mean, uh, have serious kind of consequences for startups. Um, and not just that, but also local VCs that, you know, either we have spoken to in the recent times or have, you know, spoken on webinars or expressed their opinion in any way, have said that, you know, they're going to prioritize their existing portfolio companies over making new investments. So, you know, most of them have been pointing to the fact that, you know, it's, least likely for startups to raise funding, uh, at least to startups that are working in the hardly hit uh, sectors right now, uh, to raise funding in this year. Um, and obviously inter for international investors, it's the same as well, the you know, increased risk and Pakistan probably not being uh, you know, kind of high on their priority list. Um, so why 
is this an issue for, and how is this an issue for startups? When we talk about that, I think the biggest thing is that the study that we put out in 2019, uh, Pakistan Startup Ecosystem Report, um, showed that from 2018 to 2019, we had 40 deals, out of which 35% was attributed to VC funding, both local and international. So when we look at that, and then we think about, you know, this 35% drying up, that really paints a really bleak picture for right now, at least. Um, and then on top of that, we have 101 respondents for, you know, who participated in the study who said, you know, 50% of said that of them have, have said that, um, you know, they're already facing delays in the ongoing investment deals. And we're not even talking about the 37% that have no deals in the pipeline, right? So this is again, a really challenging situation. And then moreover, when we move on to the cash runway and how many months of the cash runway they have, we see that most of them, 40% have reported that they have one to three months of a cash runway. 26% uh, have said three to six months of a cash runway. So you, you see how this is progressing, right? So you have most of the companies that have somewhere from one to six months of a cash runway. And these are companies that are already facing delays in raising investment. And at the same time, we have other companies who do not have any deals in the pipeline at all. So that really is a difficult situation for startups. Um, so to sum it up, I feel like the biggest kind of takeaway for us from this study has been that um, startups, I feel like right now, as you know, other experts globally have also identified is that startups right now need to kind of um, really, you know, operate on a lean model, not waste money, you know, save as much financial resources as they can. Because the one thing that matters the most right now is for these startups um, who are very, very vulnerable right now to survive uh, the pandemic. So that's the only priority right now, I feel like. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, the Bijan. Bijan. Yeah. Thanks, Ambreen. And I just posted, for those who are interested, I posted a link to where you can access this research. Um, just as a quick aside, as Bijan is speaking, um, we're going to turn it over to our panelists after. There is a Q&A box um, that's here. If you have questions, please post in there and we'll get to it in the last half of the panel. Um, go ahead, Bijan. You're on mute. Let me unmute you. There you go. No. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, Amrin, would you mind that if I share my own screen, that will be easier for me to operate? Yeah. Let's see. Wait. Yay, technology. Share. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Hold on. Let me go to present. Perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Abrin. I think for the presentation, it was uh, uh, it was uh, important for us to look at the ecosystem, and I think I can present the same for Bangladesh. Uh, so, just to give a brief that where Bangladesh stands now, at Bangladesh, we have more than 1,000 plus startups in the ecosystem right now, which creates close to 1.5 million uh, plus uh, direct employments. Uh, these are employees, uh, other uh, logistics players who feed into the startups. And if you think about in terms of number of uh, families, there are close to 6 million people who's, whose livelihood directly depend on the startup ecosystem. So far, the ecosystem over the last uh, three to four years have raised close to $200 million in international capital. The most popular uh, sector seems to be logistics, ride sharing, and fintech. And uh, the country currently has a 95% mobile penetration, uh, and of that, which 55% has uh, mobile internet users. Some of the flag bears in the ecosystem are large online grocery systems like Chaldal, Sheba XYZ, which is one of the largest uh, online service marketplace, uh, ShopUp, which is a fintech company, Pathau and Shoyter, ride sharing logistics, and Bikash, which is uh, one of the largest mobile financial services uh, company in the world, recently raised a large amount from Ant Financials. On the COVID, uh, we uh, interviewed close to 200 plus companies uh, in early April. And what is very, uh, 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 what is very important to understand that close to one fourth of them, 25% have completely stopped their operations under the COVID scenario, and close to 50% is seeing a 50%, at least a 50% drop in revenue. Uh, one of the largest, three, three of the largest sectors that have been hit badly are uh, the Facebook commerce, e-commerce, and ride sharing, possibly due to the uh, large companies that are out there and you know, because logistics and everything is coming to stand, stand still because of the lockdown. Uh, there is an 80% drop in the revenue of e-commerce businesses, and eight out of the top 10 startups, uh, which generate, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least 50% large amount of employment, saw so 50% drop in revenue. So at this point, there is a, around 1.5 million jobs that are on the stack. And 
many of the large companies, fintech, have already started out started laying off employees as well. It is estimated that if this persists for a longer time or a period of nine to twelve months, the total loss to the country would be as high as fifty six million. If if I take a look at this, that uh, as you can see, that almost close to hundred percent of the businesses have uh, you know dropped down in revenue, and another thirty percent plus fifty uh, percent plus is seeing a drop in revenue as well. Only a very small percentage uh, has seen more than 50% increase in business, but these are businesses that have started focusing on essential commodities. And because uh, due to the lockdown, the need for essential commodities and home delivery have uh, gone up, these are some of the sectors that are seeing an increased revenue. If I uh, go uh, even uh, by stages, I think uh, businesses, startups on all different stages has been affected. But I think the, uh, the seed stage uh, considerably has been affected the most and at least more than 50% of the series to start up saw a decrease in their business. Uh, we did kind of like an analysis on the upper and lower points of uh, sector wise. While you can see uh, grocery is something very interesting where there are some businesses which saw more than 100% increase in revenue while, uh, while uh, I will see a no change. And there are, but for most of the sectors, as we can see, advertisement, even agriculture, a lot of the startups have seen uh, at least uh, uh, anything between stopping the 100% drop in revenue to at least minus 20% drop in revenue. So uh, I think apart from grocery, uh, logistics, and fintech, most of the other sectors either shows no change or at least uh, a significant amount of revenue drop. Uh, and uh, some of the sectors that has been hit hardest are, are like travel, uh, you know, uh, uh, sub food and beverage. Uh, and these are seeing large drops. And this is something to think about that, you know, uh, including some essential sectors, we're seeing a drop as well. Uh, if you look at uh, how the stars are coping with that, I think the first step is that uh, um, close to 30% of them are reducing their variable cost. And then a lot of them has adopted uh, another 30% another around has adopted freezing salaries or reducing salaries up to a certain point. And another 20% has also dropped salaries of senior management or foregoing salaries at the moment. Still a small percentage is uh, going into layoff 20%, but we, we think that uh, this is something that will become more commonplace if the situation persists. And uh, some of the startups, a very small percentage are actually also disposing of fixed assets uh, to cope with the current uh, pandemic as well. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something to look at as well. Uh, close to 60% of the startups have a last, last runway less than three months. And it's understandable. Like a lot of the startups, uh, you know, they do not have a lot of uh, reserve capital in the bank. So if this situation persists over a three month period and uh, with the current status quo, you know, as long as 60% of them will exhaust all their reserves. Uh, so if you ask that, what are the kind of solutions they're seeking to it in terms of financing? So more than 60% actually wants uh, uh, some form of leverage. Uh, so we asked, uh, what do you want? Is it a long-term loan? Is it equity, quasi-equity, convertible bonds, a short-term loan? So though 20% want the solutions like equity and quasi-equity, but close to 60% uh, wants a mix of long-term loans or convertible bond or short-term low interest loans. Uh, a very small percentage is also looking for grants as well. But uh, this is something the startups want a reserve capital, uh, you know, that will allow them to push through the COVID-19 crisis and help them uh, recover when this goes out. Uh, the funding uh, is actually has gone down a lot as well. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the funding scenario in Bangladesh, uh, uh, even in Pakistan and some of the uh, companies is lower compared to China and India, though our GDP uh, uh, per capita growth rate was high. But I think the funding, funding system has dropped again significantly. And I think uh, 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 it has uh, also added that a lot of the startups uh, and I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, we had a talk with a lot of interviews that actual checks that were supposed to come during before the pandemic, those checks have also been shut down. Like investors are not really interested to invest. They, they are in a kind of like a wet and see mood and see back their existing for, portfolio as opposed to going for new, uh, you know, growth financing and everything. So their advice to startups is, you know, survive this pandemic and then uh, they will talk about funding. Um, uh, there are a few initiatives that are happening in Bangladesh to support the ecosystem. One of those initiatives is uh, the Mission Safe Bangladesh uh, that has close to 100 plus brands and startups. I think all the major startups and a lot of the uh, actual brands that are partnering in the initiative, uh, they have supported close to 5,000 plus families, uh, uh, close to 25,000 people over the last one month. And I think uh, this initiatives, the startup ecosystem is also coming up, uh, even though they are not on the often not in the right position to support, but they are trying their best to help the ecosystem in Bangladesh to move forward, uh, protect the livelihoods of people in it as well. Uh, if I look at some of the recommendations that came up on the investor side, the sentiment was that uh, most of the investors want to mentor their existing portfolio and bridge, provide bridge support as, as applicable, but they are not willing to go into new investments. 
uh, they are uh, uh, focusing more on sustainability rather than profitability. And, uh, uh, and there are a few impact funds that are coming up uh, from development partners uh, like uh, uh, SDC or even DFID. And I think uh, uh, this is also time for startups to uh, figure out whether if they're into essential commodities and uh, providing a critical impact to the ecosystem, whether they can uh, apply for this impact investing funds as well. Uh, most of the advices that came to the startups were that pivot business model were possible, but do not uh, pivot like mindlessly, like uh, do not go into essential components, grocery delivery if you don't have the infrastructure, but do try to pivot in certain segments that will uh, provide uh, good traction. For example, uh, the ride sharing company, Pathau kind of uh, uh, pivoted into pivot tong, which provides uh, uh, critical essential medicines and grocery services, but they did, did have the uh, architecture to do that. Uh, one of the other things to look at exploring strategic partnerships and mergers. And of course, uh, focus on uh, cost reduction uh, because fundraising is going to take a frankly bit of time because a lot of the investors and we're in C mode. I think um, you know, uh, sustainability and sustaining the storm should be there uh, at, the, at, the, at the critical juncture and that will be the prime location at this point. Some of the government support that startups have been asking where you know, uh, revolves around uh, grant and refinancing as well as specific funds dedicated to startups. And not only funds, there can be other kind of in-kind support in terms of uh, you know, data centers, warehouse facilities, or working spaces, and even mentorship. So those are some of the recommendations that came from uh, the different uh, players and the interviews that we conducted. Again, we, we, we have this uh, uh, data and everything in our website and we're releasing a white paper on this soon. So if you want more data, please feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to you know, share these reports with you guys as well. Uh, thank you, I'll stop here and I will uh, pass on the mic over to Kalsum. Thank you. Okay, thanks Bijan. Um, and thank you for that presentation. I think what's interesting is just how similar the data is, to be honest. So it's not anything that that's surprising. I think the correlation for me, the thing that we found most interesting and something that's reflected even in our own behavior as investors right now, as, as players that work in the startup space in Pakistan, is the correlation between um, how much cash is in the bank for most companies. The fact that like 50% in Bangladesh and Pakistan, it's really similar, only have about three months of cash runway left. And given how funding will be compromised. I think that's that's going to be the challenge, right, for people to think about how they're pivoting their businesses and thinking about other things. Um, I'm going to open it up because we have some amazing panelists that are in both Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, Tina, obviously, representing what's happening on the government federal level side on how government is supporting um, both from a digital Bangladesh perspective, as well as what they're doing in the pandemic. And then Muneeb is obviously a really well-known founder in uh, Pakistan, uh, recently last year raised his Series A, um, that was 5.7 million, is that, a, that's the official number. Um, so what I would love to do before we kind of dive into, um, you know, their reactions to the data, how, what they're actually doing in the pandemic and how they're behaving, I would love for you guys uh, from Muneeb and Tina, so maybe Muneeb first, if you want to just introduce yourself um, and what Bikea does, but also if you can introduce why, why you're doing this, like what led you to start this um, and be part of the startup space in this way, because you are a serial entrepreneur. You obviously um, have, this is, I think your third company. Um, so would love to hear more from you. And then I'll pass it on to Tina to also explain why she had decided to come back to Bangladesh and be part of this startup Bangladesh initiative as well. So many. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me out here. Um, I'm Muneeb Meyer. Um, I am founder at Baikia. Baikia is uh, very similar to Patau uh, in Bangladesh. We're, we're a network of uh, motorbikes, mostly. Um, and most of what we do is transport uh, around, uh, uh, around people um, on the back of a motorbike. And uh, part of our business is also deliveries. And we've been around now for three years. Um, you know, started by Kia uh, with a colleague of mine after spending four years at Daraz, where I was co-founder and CEO uh, for the Pakistan business. Um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, just felt that, you know, if the, if, if technology, and a platform has to be leveraged um, at scale for a larger demographic. Uh, it just can't be for e-commerce. You just can't sell smartphones, uh, brand new smartphones to a very, very large addressable market. Uh, and wanted to build a platform which would be hyper-local, so focused on cities within the city 
and still use the internet, but match people um, for services as opposed to match people to buy and sell things. Um, so, so yeah, so about, uh, after about four years at the Oz, uh, uh, started by Kia, um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, um, we, we structured ourselves as a marketplace, which is a good thing because now it allows us to leverage our network, uh, for a multitude of other things, but to be candid, most of our business was. Uh, and continues to be, hopefully, after this, uh, you know, after this lockdown, the transport business, uh, with everything else sort of amplifying the utilization of the driver base. But, uh, but you know, we were uh, we were ill-equipped to 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 sort of you know um, be hit with this with this magnitude of a uh, of a lockdown that's completely crippled our business and. Uh, now we've had we've had our taxi business suspended since the beginning of the lockdown. The delivery business is open, but you know we we don't really serve uh, the upper echelons of society who have the luxury of ordering in food um, or the luxury of basically buying brand new things when when there's a lockdown. So, so even when we did deliveries, it was mostly around uh, serving small small stores or shops uh, or wholesale markets, ferrying goods and samples back and forth to each other. So with the markets shut down, we've kind of lost that business as well. Uh, but I'll talk more about what we're planning and what we're doing um, in, a, in a sec. So I'll let yeah, Tina I wanna, Yeah, I wanna dive deeper into that as well. Um, so Tina, if you could go next and just introduce yourself, start up on with us, yes. but also why you decided to join this initiative. Sure, first of all, thank you, Kalsum. And I'm Reen and Munib and Bijan. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to meet you guys virtually. Um, so um, I'm Tina Jabin. Um, I am investment advisor to Startup Bangladesh, uh, ICT Ministry Government of Bangladesh. And Startup Bangladesh is, is an initiative which is basically um, um, is geared towards uh, fostering um, uh, innovative venture capital uh, type of um, ecosystem in Bangladesh. And the reason is, um, you know, we, we have a, uh, we are one of the youngest countries in the world with uh, more than 50% of the population is um, under 35 and uh, also very talented, um, educated, and uh, we wanted to move to the technology um, economy rather than just the manufacturing economy right now we have. So, so that is kind of the vision and obviously, you know, you, I'm sure you guys are aware of Digital Bangladesh. And one of the pillar of digital Bangladesh is uh, human capital de development and the other pillar is uh, technology. So all of these you know, fits very well into Startup Bangladesh's mission. And it started about three and a half years ago. Um, you know, it's kind of a pioneering initiative for Bangladesh, uh, the ICT ministry to take this, uh, uh, take this uh, campaign and uh, come up with a VC fund, uh, which we have right now, Startup Bangladesh company. And also we have a project called Idea Project, which is basically doing grants to um, idea stage start startups. So that's kind of, you know, the um, story behind the Startup Bangladesh. And just a quick thing, when I started um, in, so I was part of the, part of putting this whole program together and the investment guidelines and so on. Uh, but, you know, at that time, three and a half years ago, um, there was about probably a couple of hundred of startups and we just heard Bijan and he said that, you know, it kind of um, grew over three and a half years, um, two thousands. So that is a huge success story. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that, you know, you can get the, the impact that you can make um, in a country like Bangladesh mm -hmm. is huge, exponential. And that is what brought me back. So, you know, I, I am a, a very much of a Silicon Valley person. I spent about 30 years of my life there as a, um, uh, I was in a private equity fund uh, and also worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers in VC fund, basically in the late, early 90s, early 90s. Wow. So, um, yeah, late 90s, sorry. Sorry, so anyway, so it's been a, quite a few years. Um, Two decades almost and I thought that you know why not um, why not go back and 
um, whatever I learn, you know, try to do something with it, make, make, a, make impact to people's life in a meaningful way. And uh, so I came back about three and a half years ago and uh, started working with um, brilliant people like Bijan and also the peers that he has and also our startup community. Um, so I'll stop there and then, you know, I'm sure we'll have yeah. lots of questions. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And I mean, I, I think Bijan and I met a couple of maybe three or four years ago now. And I feel like the Bangladesh startup ecosystem was really early about five years ago. And I feel like we've seen the startup ecosystem there actually grow pretty exponentially over the last five years, which I think is pretty amazing. And it's mostly concentrated in Taka, which is, is really cool to see. Um, yeah. Yeah. So going over to the Pakistan ecosystem, which um, we've been lucky to, been, to have been a part of for over eight years now. Um, Manib has obviously also been part of that startup space for a while, but he has been around for a number of years now. Um, you kind of started to touch on how COVID-19 has impacted and has been has been bad in terms of, you know, the fact that you guys are ride hailing for a specific demographic. But I also know that Bikea is still continuing operations just in a different way in terms of relief that you guys are providing. Can you talk a little bit more about how you guys are handling the pandemic and what you're thinking about even in the, in the short term? Because we're only a month into the pandemic right now. What are you guys thinking about? Yeah, so, um, so I think, I think, you know, we, we recognize that that ride billion riding on motorbikes, um, and for that matter, all ride sharing is perhaps gonna be suspended in one form or the other for the next three four weeks, perhaps. So probably leading up to Eid, right? So so really, uh, when do we when do we see things uh, coming back to normal? Um, most probably around June 1st or so. Right? And, then, and then, you know, so the question is basically, you know, how do you keep all your employees, um, you know, how do you keep them busy? How do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them um, building things which will be relevant once this lockdown ends? Mm -hmm. so, so I think we've, we've sort of split things up by one working on, new product development. Uh, and the plan, of course, for all of that is really to, to push and accelerate on, on enhancements and features to our product post June 1st. Um, but then in terms of, you know, what are we supposed to do now? Like, mm -hmm. you can just sit in and do nothing, which is also possible. But, you know, we wanted to we wanted to basically provide some opportunity for our driver partners to have some level of income. So we've been lobbying for the past three weeks to, to sort of have the government one ease the lockdown on deliveries, right? And one of the first things we did was we reached out and we said, hey, can we help the government do food ration deliveries, right? because there was a lot of talk about doing these food ration deliveries and yet nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. right? And, and I, you know, the governments tend to get caught in bureaucracy many a time. So, so we came in and we offered our help. And to be honest, I think, you know, um, we went in saying, hey, let's start this. And to be candid, I think initially we did a lot of it really for free, right, pro bono, um, you know, which, which was a huge risk, but, um, we wanted to, we want to get the ball going, right? Um, and we said, listen, let's let's go in and 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 give the state um, certain SOPs that they they can hold us accountable to, and also hold every logistics company out there accountable to, right? So 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 we we gave them a list of uh, SOPs that we'd follow um, that we felt that others should also follow, um, and so so that's how we got the ball going, and. Um, you know, we're still doing a chunk of those deliveries. You know, not everything's pro bono now. Uh, but again, you know, it's, 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 it's very small for us right now, but we're still trying to, we're trying to latch on to where any potential volume of business is so that our driver partners don't go hungry, right? Mm -hmm. You have to realize in the gig economy, most of these guys, if they, if they don't do a job, they don't get paid, right? Yeah. So yeah. we went in initially um, 
two weeks in, we we took money out of whatever kitty of dollars we had, right? And we set up a fund, and we we, we basically donated, um, you know, these these grant sort of allocations to some of our drivers. But then two weeks onwards, you know, that, that wasn't sustainable. I mean, you know, we tried to basically crowdsource people to donate money. You know, everyone's been in a saving mode, so we couldn't even scale that. So after about like 7 million rupees in, um, you know, after that, we, we, we really said we have to now somehow convince the state to open deliveries up. And so we lobbied for a couple of weeks, we lobbied with all stakeholders um, within the state uh, to, to enable and uh, to, to, to allow us to, to start deliveries at least. So, um, you know, um, it's allowed us to turn the business back up again um, so we've got now 5% of our business, 7% of our business maximum, mm-hmm. you know, and, but that's, that's at least, you know, allowed some of the most, you know, some of the most vulnerable drivers to have some source of income, right? Because, you know, these are not people who uh, had any savings. So, mm-hmm. so we've, been, we've been sort of facilitating, enabling that to, to a certain extent. And I can, I can speak about new product initiatives, uh, but you know that's I'll speak to that when as and when we get to that. Yeah. No, and I think that's really important because I think what you're speaking to also is beyond companies and mobility, which are also getting really impacted. It's it's gig economy startups, right? Which are really powered by people who are often from very low income, very high risk backgrounds. So it's it's a real question of how do you preserve them? How do you keep them alive and afloat? Um, and you were also kind of touching on the role of the state. So I'm going to pull that uh, pull Tina into this conversation as well in terms of what role should the state play, right? And um, for Tina, you know, when we're thinking about com- uh, governments around the world right now, everyone is being asked to, there's this constant term of livelihoods versus lives, right? Which is this idea that, you know, we need to, the livelihoods are really at stake when we're thinking about, you know, what Mani mentioned in terms of how many people rely on a source of income to stay afloat. At the same time, if we are allowing people to go back to work, we are obviously putting lives at stake as well. So governments are having to make these really hard decisions right now in terms of choosing <laughs> lives over livelihoods right now and then figuring out from a state perspective, what they should do or what they can do to provide relief to their citizens and for people who are suffering really greatly. Um, In Pakistan, what we've seen actually, which is, you know, unfortunate, is that even when they did release a stimulus plan uh, for, you know, the business sector, startups were actually left out of that. Um, But I know that's not necessarily the case Mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. So what I would love to hear from you is, um, how is Startup Bangladesh, you know, via the IT ministry and the government of Bangladesh, how are you guys approaching the pandemic right now? Um, I've seen on your website that there is efforts that are going on. How are you guys thinking about um, the role that you guys can play in the pandemic? Um, and what role should, you know, what role should government continue to play? Because obviously this goes beyond just the next month or two months, right? This is going to be at least a year out when we're thinking about the dramatic impact and ramifications of this. Thanks, Kosum. I think the story is kind of similar with Pakistan and Bangladesh and probably in many of the countries. Um, so the, like Bijan said, said that, you know, the startup ecosystem, I call it, you know, they are in the brink of disaster. Um, basically, if, if, and this is, I don't think this is just Bangladesh. It's actually in, a, in, this, in this South Asian region. So if, uh, if nothing is done, if nothing is done, especially in Bangladesh, you know, the, the whole ecosystem will rewind back to five years. And I don't think that you know, to come to where we are today, it will not take five years. It will actually probably take way more than five years. So, so basically what it tells us is that we have to do something. Some interventions need to, needs to be taken and you know, private and public uh, on the both sides. So from our side, from Startup Bangladesh side or from the government side, you know, we have been, um, uh, Bijan referred to this uh, dialogue that we have been having with the ICT ministry. And there are uh, certain measures that we are looking at. So uh, one, uh, one of them is expediting funds that we already have uh, at our disposal. Uh, so that's one. And uh, then the other one is also uh, reaching out to next year's budget 
and see if we can get some fund allocated now um, to you know uh, address the need. So we'll see how it goes. You know, there are different type of um, avenues that we are looking into. But the important thing is that um, that startup ecosystem is important. We have to we have to um, rescue them. That message is very clear and very clearly understood by the government. So now it's a matter of time. Um, so that's you know that's a good thing. Um, also, um, Munib mentioned the the riders ridership, right? Because you know most of these most of these riders or the drivers, they are, you know, they do this as their um, second income to supplement their, uh, you know, whatever day job that they're doing. So same thing in Bangladesh. And in some cases, this is their only income. Um, so what, uh, what we looked at is that um, if some of these, some of the services that these, um, you know, uh, startups are providing are these essential are these critical to the infrastructure of running the country so for example you know the online groceries somebody needs to deliver them online groceries is very important when you're locked down you know chaldal is one of our marquee uh, startup <clears throat> for online groceries and you know they also need riders to take it to the um, uh, customer's house so there comes you know our patao there comes our shahod um, and the, then also, you know, all the other rider startups. So um, in that case, you know, government um, did looked into it and uh, there are like special permission that they have so they can move around in the city. Um, I mean, there are some bumps, nothing is smooth, but at least, you know, that is taken care of. Um, also, there is one thing that came out and I'm not sure how this is in Pakistan. Uh, one thing that came out is that there is a stimulus package for informal workers. So like the rickshaw pullers and the day laborers, um, you know, the informal workers category. Um, so what we asked for is that we want our, the, the drivers and uh, drivers and then also, um, you know, uh, like the service people who work like Shiva XYZ, who provides like all kinds of uh, domestic services, um, repair service, AC service, all kinds of service. So we wanted those type of SMEs and, um, you know, individuals to be part of that stimulus package. That is one of our proposal. Haven't, uh, you know, obviously it will take a while, but I think that, you know, the, the thing is that it's, it's going, you know, we, are, we have the opportunity to, to share our concern and it's being heard. And now we just have to wait and see. Um, so, so, so basically that's what's happening. You know, there is, I, I'm sorry to, sorry that I cannot say that this is, there is a solution right now. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is, you know, things are in progress. And I think that's good. And what I'd be curious about, and I'm going to ask many of this, but also open it to Bijan and Ambreen if they want to weigh in as well. Um, what role should government be playing at this point, right? Beyond, I mean, many of you kind of touched on how you guys are working with the government. Tina was mentioning what, um, what they're thinking about doing and it's in progress, but is there more that government should be doing right now? And we're looking at Pakistan and Bangladesh and, and especially when it comes to beyond startup relief, but also support of, you know, companies that are generally going to be losing so much right now in this time. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, uh, I think all the initiatives startups are taking are essentially initiatives around bringing transparency and efficiency to what we otherwise do in our regular course of life, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's, um, you know, whether it's a startup around healthcare or a startup around education or a startup around payments or a startup around transport. I mean, you know, the state needs to wake up and for once now realize that there's no value in buying brand, brand new like fighter jets mm -hmm. or missile systems. You've got you've to gotta invest in, in science and technology. 
right? Because clearly, not even the United States of America could defend its 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 borders against an attack of this nature, right? So, so the folks who are out there, like ourselves, like like the Choldos, like the Patals, you know, it's it's time to sort of partner with us and allow us to bring the transparency into in a government to 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 people distribution, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's a black box, and we keep talking about corruption, and it's solvable, right? Because we can bring the transparency into the system, but it, it's just that that decision isn't being undertaken, right? Yeah. Now, in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, furloughs, for example, in, in, in England, right? Mm -hmm. All the furloughs in England are, are sort of, like 80% of the compensation against those furloughs or somewhere around that figure is actually gonna be paid by the state, right? And, and that's because the state has a lot of capital, has a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I think this this could have been an opportunity for, um, you know, for for the state to even discover how many companies have how many employees, yeah, right? Because because like if you, if if companies can tell you how many employees they have, then then clearly post lockdown and post COVID, you should be able to understand how much they earn or assess how much they should pay in taxes, right? This is the time to to to, to to gather that information, right? yeah. it also like like absolutely like you know am amuses me why you know we you know in all these countries we haven't been able to use very basic technology to to sort of track and clamp down on things. You know, everyone says, oh, you know, China could track their 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 people down. And how how did they track their people down? They mm -hmm. essentially. They went in and they started, for example, checking, you know, if, if I'm on WeChat and you're on WeChat and we've been in close proximity to each other, they started to basically identify whether you and I are, are at risk. And, and then maybe I could get a red. And if I, if I tested positive, you would get a yellow too. And you'd mm -hmm. get flagged too mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. state to go and test yourself. But all of that's quite possible, not only with GPS technology, but with GPRS technology, like literally, with you know, with triangulation, you can you can do you can do fifty to seventy meter accuracy on proximity, right? And they need to leverage the startups or the tech companies within their countries to help them do this analysis. It's not very complicated. Mm -hmm. It's just that you know, many times, uh, particularly emerging uh, you know emerging geography countries tend to find. Um, you know, find solutions only in the Oracles, in the Microsofts, in the Googles, in the Facebooks, mm -hmm. not recognizing that the technology is not very complicated and it can be built by, you know, people in their own countries. And, and, and you know, if we can, if we can build software for, for the world, <laughs> clearly we can build software for, the, for, for, for our own countries as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, the state, the state just needs to come in and work with us now. But you know what I've seen is there's there's not a lot of like there's a lot of talk, but there's not a lot of like real action. Right. Has that been so? And I think that's a really good point, right? Especially when we think about the fact that I mean, there's just so much more that the state could be doing generally, but also in terms of quantifying. I loved your point when you said about quantifying that because I think oftentimes we love to talk about like startups because it's a buzzy word to talk about, especially like, you know, in, in Pakistan, we love to talk about startups, but we don't actually sometimes quantify like what the economic impact is, what are the ramifications of all these jobs that are being lost. Um, Bijan, have you guys, and I know with LCP and everything that you guys have been doing, has that been a, a more productive conversation with your government in terms of being able to push them for startup policy that's really real? right, in terms of actual, because obviously what we've seen with what Tina has been doing in Startup Bangladesh, there's been actionable things that have happened. Have you guys been able to quantify that in a way that's been able to push government to do things better? Well, I think uh, for Bangladesh, uh, uh, especially the ICT ministry, I would say has been um, 
a front runner in i think uh, as a government uh, uh, they often understood the local investment ecosystem is still emerging uh, so i think uh, 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 i think earlier uh, late last year they declared a bdd 100 core uh, vc fund under the and Estrada Bangladesh is also become a co becoming a company now. Mm -hmm. so I think those are really exemplary initiatives from the government. The government actually coming in and setting up a fund and saying, "Hey, we are putting in risk capital into the ecosystem," and that kind of allows um, you know other players to have more confidence in the ecosystem as well as international investors. Uh, those are some of the things I think the ICT ministry has come a long way. Uh, you know, and uh, they goes with the vision of digital Bangladesh. But I think, um, adding on to the point, I think the other ministries and everything also needs to follow suit. So, for example, if uh, FinTech really needs to you know, pick up and you know, become a mainstream in Bangladesh, which has happened with the help of uh, mobile financial services, I think mm -hmm. um, there has to be much more support from the central bank on being very specific uh, supports towards technology companies. And it just cannot be the ministry of ICD. All the other ministries also needs to come on board as well. And I right. think it, it, uh, from the government standpoint, it's not something very easy because uh, these are decades of structure that's out there. But I think um, uh, uh, seeing ICD ministry as an example, I think if the other ministries also come forward and support innovation in a way that brings in more transparency and speed into the ecosystem, that will take uh, you know, much, us much further and much quicker uh, than we have seen. Yeah. But I think Tina Apa can obviously elaborate on what I'm speaking about as well. Yeah, not sure if you want to add to that. And you're on mute, um, Tina. Oh, thanks, Bijan. Um, I think yes, I, I think that you know uh, I agree with Bijan that ICT Ministry has been extremely supportive, especially the uh, State Minister that we have, uh, Mr. Zunaid Ahmed Fallo, and also you know our National ICT Advisor. Uh, both are extremely uh, supportive and very focused on making sure that, you know, the startup community thrives in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So this is a, you know, kind of a challenging time. And a couple of things that came in my mind that uh, right now there are certain initiatives that we are taking, which is already um, happening. One is, you know, call for nation, which is a kind of a call for submission for any type of solutions, solutions and uh, our business solutions product, which is relevant to COVID-19, uh, market or health issues uh, post uh, COVID-19. So that is going on. And I think, you know, it's kind of keeping the, our young entrepreneurs and also the students, it's open to everybody. Uh, students, everybody and everybody a bit enthused and encouraged, right? Because, you know, it, it, people can fall into depression. This is not a very happy time for anybody. So we are also, you know, doing something that campaign like that and also the other thing is uh, talking about, we don't mention the other ministries. I totally agree that, um, you know, everybody needs to think about innovation. Digital Bangladesh is not just ICT ministry. Digital yeah. Bangladesh is the everything that, and things needs, needs to be digitized in order to, for us uh, to become the, by 20, uh, 2025, we have to, 2030, we have to meet the SDG goals and then also 2041 we plan to become a developed nation mm -hmm. so we have to touch every single sector um you know technology needs to touch every single sector so um two things that has happened is that um one is about supply chain agriculture product and food because you know obviously with all these broken transportation lockdown and whatnot uh supply chain is uh, is hugely compromised and we worry about, you know, what will happen in the, not the next three months, but after next three months, mm -hmm. because, you know, the, all the things that is, that is supposed to be harvested now and the livestock and everything, um, it's not being taken care of now. So after three months, you know, we'll, we may see a big shortage. So that is one thing where, you know, the ICT ministry is working with the food and agriculture ministry. And I know that some of the startups are part of uh, some pilot programs. And then now we are looking into education ministry because you know, the online education is, is, going, is definitely going to be part of yeah. mainstream. So, um, so that's, that's all you know, that I wanted to kind of comment on. No, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's the ed tech sector and ours. Ambreen, go ahead. Do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, so I, I think I completely agree with uh, Muneeb, what Muneeb said before in terms of how nothing is quantified in Pakistan, uh, which is a major issue. We don't know how much of a contribution these companies are making to the to the GDP from, you know, tourism companies that are completely shut down to other companies, you know. So I feel like that's obviously the first thing um, that needs to be done and obviously it cannot be done right now. It's something that's incremental and that needs to be built up um, you know, the infrastructure of it needs to be built up way before anything like this happens. So I feel like that's a big thing. But other than that, one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, this is the least that the government can do right now is at least consolidate information on where these companies can go to seek help. You know, even if the stimulus package does not really cover uh, startups, there are other uh, relief funds out there. There are other financial uh, resources out there that these companies, these startups can actually go to, right? They can like, you know, they can get support from those those, those uh, financial resources. So I feel like the issue is, I, I literally was just looking at SECP's website and there's nothing on there. There is a lot of stuff on hand washing and things, uh, which is obviously something, you know, a lot of this information has been so repetitive. We know all of this, but there's no, like, you know, there's no content available that supports startups specifically that says, you know, here is some website sites that you can visit to, you know, get this and this information. So I feel like that's a major gap. And um, the third thing is that even if there are resources out there, um, the one of the biggest things a lot of times, and I think we discussed this in our last report that came out in 2019 as well, is that, you know, one of the ways how government's efficiencies are, is efficiency is gauged in terms of policies is that it's not just making right policies, but it's also ensuring that the people find out about those policies. So, you know, what are, what are those things that are actually, you know, making this time easier, making this issue easier, uh, or getting through this problem easier for startups, and how can people find out about those policies? So I feel like that's, for me at least, that's a major, major disconnect. Um, and I feel, I really feel like it doesn't always have to be financial resources. It can sometimes be, support can be, you know, in different forms and shapes. Um, yeah. That's, we just need them yeah, to do something. I, Go ahead, Mini. I just want to, I want to add a couple of things um, to what Ambreen said. So, 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 you know, I think this could have been, and still is, I, I think we can literally do this now. I, I, I think this is a great opportunity to actually introduce or foster or prod digital currencies. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you want to make a distribution of $100 or $80 to someone who's poor, right? Why are you allowing that money to be encashed in physical currency? Like if you're making an electronic payment to someone, just enforce that that payment cannot be, it cannot be in cashed out in currency mm -hmm. and flush digital money into the, into the ecosystem, right? And start fostering people to start using digital money, right? And, and when you do that, and, and, and that's, listen, I mean, the reality is why, why is digital money important? The reason why digital money important is because, you know, um, you know, a hundred rupees, a hundred dollars to consume. If I give you a hundred dollars to consume and you pass that on to like, you know, uh, Bijan, Bijan passes that to Embreen, Embreen passes that on to Tina. By the time Tina gives me that hundred dollars back, it's still a hundred dollars in cash. But when it's digital and you've got like, you know, a dollar cut from each transaction, the state's made five, six dollars right there, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the absolute best time to introduce digital payments and money that can't be converted to cash. And, and you know, sure, there could be inflation, right? But I say inflation is a tad better than recession, mm -hmm. right? Like <laughs> what we're looking at now globally is recession. What is the United States doing? Printing money. Huh? So, so if you can't print money, then, then, Give some money and and maybe put some restrictions around that money, but but start gathering data as Ambreen was saying, you know, and two start tracking and the opportunities now. I mean, we could mm -hmm. really take this as an opportunity now. And that's actually was 
is a good segue into my next question, um, which is about this, you know, for, so first of all, on fintech, it's a huge opportunity because right now the fintech sector, at least in Pakistan, I'm not sure about in Bangladesh, but um, the reason we haven't seen major leapfrogging in fintech is because just of the amount of regulations in the fintech space, right, in terms of banking licenses and how expensive it is for people to really, truly innovate the fintech sector. So it's an opportunity to actually lower those barriers to allow for innovations to take place. Um, Maneeb, to your point, though, about when we're thinking about the opportunity right now. So I think so much, you know, we're talking about COVID-19 and it's very doom and gloom uh, in terms of, you know, even when we're looking at our data, right, it looks like a lot of companies can potentially die out. But um, to speak to you and as well as, I mean, you did a TEDx talk um, back in November of last year and you talked about this vision for digital Pakistan. In some ways, there's opportunity right now for that, but not just for Pakistan, but also Bangladesh. And I know, Tina, you know, originally there was a 2021 vision for a digital Bangladesh and obviously that's being extended. Um, what are the opportunities right now? And do you guys see that? Where are the spaces right now beyond even, you know, obviously by Kia Cash launched um, right before all of this happened. Where do you guys see the spaces for opportunity and for innovation um, in the post-pandemic world? And maybe we can go well, Mini first and then Tina, Bijan, Ambrina, yeah. whoever wants to go. Well, for one, I think... Um, Foreign companies coming in and using a lot of capital to kill local companies, I think that's going to diminish, right? So I think that's an opportunity, right? So suddenly you won't be fighting with people who are just throwing money. Right? So whether you're in Dhaka or whether you're in Karachi, I think Uber is going to spend a lot less money right? trying to kill local competition. So, so, so I, think, I think that's an opportunity, right? Um, I also think that, you know, there are opportunities around now, perhaps localized marketplaces where people can buy and sell used goods because as, um, as we all get into a recession and it's quite likely that we're gonna get into a recession, people's disposable income will shrink. And if their disposable income shrinks, um, I don't think their behaviors will change. They would still wanna buy uh, but I think that propensity to buy uh, pre-loved or refurbished things uh, will prevail. And so I think there's an opportunity around that. I also think that, um, you know, people's behavior around um, grocery delivery or, you know, just, just getting stuff FMCG delivered, uh, even to a long tail um, corner stores around, around you know, looks and corners in the city, given that they've been impacted by supply chain, I think that propensity to order digitally or order on the phone will increase as well. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity around um, education and healthcare, around video. The fact that now people, even poor people, um, you know, who historically would not, uh, would not ever use WhatsApp video, have started using WhatsApp video, right? Um, and and not not be shying away from 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 that communication. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity around chat and integrated payments with chat as well. I think there's an opportunity there. You know, so, so fintech has a huge opportunity. Um, and 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 for for and I, you know, I'll close this off from a Bikea perspective. I think we are in a way. I feel better positioned, you know, than our competition because of a couple of things. I think people's propensity to get into an air-conditioned car where air is recirculated will diminish, right? And, you know, particularly men, um, you know, who are trying to save more money now. And I think it's a good thing that we'll be saving money. We need to be more like the Asians, you know? We need to save more money than, than spend every anything that we've had in our pockets. I think people, as people, people's propensity to save increases, they'll take more, um, they'll take, take more motorbike uh, pillion rides. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to build technology around supply chain logistics. Um, and we should hopefully come out of this stronger uh, with a better product stack um, relevant for a larger addressable market than we have had in the past. So, so, Lots of opportunities uh, as long as we 
focus right now and build products which are relevant post-COVID. Great. Other thoughts from other panelists in terms of where the opportunities are? Bijan, are you going to say something? Or Tina, go ahead, whoever wants to say. It's hard to call on people because oh. I don't know if you're going about to say something. So go ahead, Tina, but oh, we'll go Umbrian. I was just, I was just going to make a very quick comment. Um, um, and that is, you know, I think that post COVID world is going to be better world. Um, it's going to be more equitable. Um, when you've mentioned about, you know, the people will be saving more, um, there are people, uh, you know, people who are disadvantaged, um, education or online education, uh, would be more, um, would be more available for them. And they're also going to be more open to it. So I think that, you know, especially on the online education one, where there is a resistance um, on the system side, you know, they were not ready, um, meaning the government side, you know, the government like Bangladesh or, you know, many of the countries, uh, our peer countries are not ready for online education. But if that really happens, think about it. You know, somebody who is going to a private school in Dhaka, Gulshan, same, same material can be delivered to somebody who is going to, who is in, you know, in this one of these uh, uh, chores in Cox's Bazaar or in one of, the, one of the remote villages. And telemedicine, think about what happens. Um, you know, uh, somebody who can access the doctor in Dhaka, same thing, you know, somebody who is in the village. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the op there are lots of opportunities and some of these opportunities are going to be good. It's going to be equitable. Um, there was a discussion about fintech and fintech is definitely going to uh, be a big part of post-COVID world, especially for Bangladesh. We are already working on an interoperable digital payment system and that is going to um, change, you know, lives of millions of people. So, you know, think about, you know, transferring money from Bikash to Rocket and then from Rocket to, you know, uh, to your uh, uh, standard chartered bank whatever it is. So, so, you know, there are lots of good things that will come out of it, but, you know, we have to make sure that um, whatever we are focusing on and investing the money on, um, we think about it, that it's, it should be equitable and also uh, making sure that, you know, it's more, um, uh, more for a better world, a green world. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's kind of, I wanted to, that, that's the comment I wanted to make. Thank you. No, thank you. And I'll let quick comments. And then I'm aware that there has been people that have been writing in questions. So I'm just going to try to lump your questions in. So we try to get to as many as possible in the last 15 minutes. So Bijan and Brian, do you have anything more to add onto what we were, what was just said? No, I think yeah, uh, I, Tinapa, yeah, sorry, Amrin, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Bijan. No, so adding on to Tinapa means we also did a kind of like a mapping. What are some of the sectors that are going to go up in the, the current and the post-COVID world? And then uh, we came up with that e-groceries, logistics, uh, digital financial services, cloud kitchen, uh, telemedicine, digital learning, uh, digital gaming. These are the, some of the things that are we are seeing that picking up and seeing an increase in business. While a lot of the things like advertising, uh, mainstream e-commerce, uh, service uh, uh, rental, those are actually uh, coming down as well. I think one of the points uh, that was good for Bangladesh as well, because uh, a significant part of the stimulus package is going to be routed through the uh, digital financial service uh, providers. I think that also uh, brings in more transparency ecosystem. And I think um, if we take this into the post COVID world where this becomes more mainstream, I think the whole economy you know, would benefit from that. Great, Ambreen. Um, yeah, so my comment was that all the sectors that everyone just talked about, specifically Bijan, um, I think those are the sectors that we see kind of, you know, uh, getting a lot of attention in the future after the pandemic has ended, hopefully. Um, but at the same time, one thing that I've noticed in, the, uh, in, 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 you know, under the current circumstances is that we have a lot of ed tech startups that have, um, you, you know, been operating in the system for quite some time. And, uh, What's interesting for me is that a lot of what they're doing has kind of highlighted um, the internet inequality of all of it. So, you know, we have a lot of these education tools, but I don't know how many of them are focusing on low income children. Uh, and even if they are, you know, do they do these kids who, for instance, you know, my household help 
all anyone that I've asked so far, all of them have said that their kids have been sitting at home. They're not doing anything. Their parents do not have the capacity to school homeschool them. So I feel like that's and that's a huge chunk of our population, right? So I what I've been thinking about who's gonna address who's gonna fill in that gap. You know, is it gonna be social entrepreneurship? Is it gonna be the same startups that kind of you know um, venture into kind of kind of you know go in and cover these this demographic as well? So that's one thing for me to kind of see that gap. Um, and the next thing which which I found really interesting was that we um, we have just like Bijan said a lot of these sectors that are getting a lot of attention right now in the post COVID world where you know a lot of these investors might be looking for quality obviously because you know you have fewer deals that you can you know most likely make will we see a kind of you know skewed um, you know, interest in startups that are more kind of suited to the COVID world. So these health tech startups, these uh, essential services startups or ed tech startups, um, you know, that might get a lot more attention uh, than any other sector that was getting attention before. So I feel like that's one major observation that I've been kind of seeing. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I think that just as a quick aside before I dive into the next question, which actually loops in a few other people's uh, thoughts and from the Q&A box, um, is just that, you know, it's great that we're thinking about the opportunities. Ultimately, the role that government really should play is, is something that I just mentioned before about the fintech space, but overall, box on the doing business rankings is pretty dismal, even though we actually improved by 22 points this year, there's still so much more um, that we can do. And so even with all of this space for opportunity, unless those regulations change and unless we shift how we do business in these countries and what those barriers are, there will still be a ceiling when it comes to what those opportunities can actually mean, right? So for me, I see like a huge amount of opportunity for contactless payments, a huge amount of opportunity from an ed tech perspective, um, but we need to be able to improve overall the, the environment for, to do business in these countries. And that's really where government, I feel, um, plays an important role. Um, I think what I wanted to um, ask was a question to all of you guys, right? Um, as well as bringing in, there was a question in, in the box about someone that was thinking about launching a company right now. And they were like, is this a good time to launch? In that also, I wanna also bring up something that speaks to the data that we had, right? So at least from our data, and it kind of points to what Bijan was talking about with their data as well, is that you know 50% of our respondents in Pakistan said they're facing delays in raising investment, but also 42% said that they only have one to three months of cash runway left, right? Which is extremely scary. Um, so for all of the panelists, what advice would you give to companies right now to survive this period and thrive afterwards? What are things that they should be thinking about? Um, and what about those who are just wanting to start a company right now? Is this a good time to think about that? And how should they be adapting their thinking for the current environment and for the potential future environment? So maybe if we want to go Manib first, Bijan, Tinapa, Umbreen. So, so, so I, think, I think this is, this is a great time to think about starting a business. And I'll tell you why. I have seen a lot of traditional family houses with a lot of money suddenly see their businesses come to a standstill right? and suddenly start getting interested in e-commerce or tech-led businesses because suddenly you know businesses that they thought would never be impacted are impacted and now they're recognizing that we may have had COVID-19 this time around, but we may have it again and again. And so how do you, as a large family house with a lot of capital, invest in something which can build redundancy mm -hmm. against your business? Okay? So I think it's a good time to start thinking about how you can enable existing businesses in your country with technology solutions. I think the time to go and copy paste models from overseas will, that will slow down, mm -hmm. right? Um, you should absolutely get inspired and learn and do a lot of research on models from other geographies. But I think access to seed capital will probably increase not decrease. Right? And I also think, um, even in terms of foreign capital, you know, the fact that so many rich people and 
funds from around the world will have access to such cheap capital, whether they're in the United States or in Europe, they'll be flush with money, right? And they're going to have to deploy that money, right? And, and you should literally work on something now and polish it, polish your product now, you know? Work, work now to polish your ideas to be able to, to get access to that capital, you know, in, in the next quarter or two. Right? I'm not saying that people are going to be running to give you capital like on June 1st. That's not what's going to happen. But I think, I think this is perhaps not a bad time for startups. Um, in fact, I think it's a great time for startups because there will be access to a lot of cheap capital because the states are just printing money and the rich will have access to more money. Great. Dijon, Tina, Ambreen, go yeah, ahead. So, so I can go ahead. So I, I, I just uh, received uh, the latest data from Startup Genome, which does uh, mm -hmm. service uh, globally. Yeah. And as per, as per their stat, I think 41% startups have a runway of less than three months. I think it's very similar to yeah. what's are happening similar in to our data as well. and yeah. Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, as I look at it uh, from kind of like a consulting viewpoint, um, I do see a lot of the investors uh, will possibly try to bridge finance for their existing portfolio. For uh, 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 new startups, I think it will be difficult. Uh, but again, uh, taking on the positive uh, note from Muneeb, what I see that if you can survive this three to six months, uh, nine months, I think there will be opportunity for you to grow. Because uh, uh, even if you do a parallel, means I think, uh, I don't know why this happens every 10 years, but on the 2000, you had the dot-com bubble. In the eight, nine, we had the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now suddenly in 2020, we have the COVID. And maybe in 2030, I don't know. I hope it's <laughs> probably not good. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you look at the financial crisis, um, what happened was that eight, nine, we saw a lot of pressure, right? But as 10, 11, 12 went away, the pressure and everything kind of eased. And you had all these um, post-financial uh, crisis startups, Uber, uh, Airbnb, right? WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp, right? Uh, all this picked up. So maybe this is an opportunity like that, you know, where the world is again for a major shift. If you can categorize on the right kind of, uh, you know, categories, uh, you know, as a startup, you're trying to find a business model, fit the market, react much quicker compared to like large companies. That's what your, you know, uh, speed is your kind of like your one of your unfair advantages. And if mm -hmm. you can do that and you can survive this pandemic over the next nine to 12 months to 18 months, I think there would be good future. Maybe I don't think it's going to be six months, but uh, definitely survive 12 to 18 months. Uh, there will be a lot of, growth opportunities for you to capitalize on. Yeah, any other comments? Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, so I feel like one of the key things that kind of helps you put all of this into perspective is the fact that um, IMF just came out with a report a couple of weeks back um, and they kind of did a, a scenario analysis in terms of, you know, how um, the global recession is going to go. So basically they drew kind of four different scenarios, you know, V-shaped recovery, uh, uh, U-shaped recovery, W-shaped recovery, and then L-shaped. So they're saying experts are right now saying that it's most likely going to be a W-shaped recovery, which a lot of times typically takes about 12 to 24 months to recover from. Um, and if that's the case, then that means that the impact of that applies to countries like Pakistan as well, probably even even worse than other countries. So I feel like it's definitely, in my opinion, I feel like it's not uh, the best time to start a company, um, especially if you're looking for, for funding. If you're hoping to raise funding sometime, you know, in a year or two years of starting your operations, I feel like it's really not a good time. But at the same time you have, so for instance, inside, uh, uh, Ignite has um, a finance relief that they're offering, uh, not really finance relief actually, they're offering fundings to new ideas in high priority areas. And they have some focus areas that, that are listed on their website. So if your uh, startup idea falls under there, you can actually apply for grants and stuff like that for fundings like that. But other than that, just like everyone said, I feel like uh, it's, it seems very unlikely for anyone to, to be able to raise funding in 
at least in this year, in 2020. Um, but at the same time, if your startup, uh, you know, falls under one of the highly functional sectors that we just discussed, like health tech or, um, you know, ed tech or essential, essential services, services. And things, then that might be a different, you know, that might be a different scenario. Um, but definitely, I mean, this is something that I, we were just, you know, listening to, uh, I was listening to a panel discussion uh, with Fes Laftab and Prabil and everybody on it the other, you know, a couple of weeks back. And they even pointed out how, you know, this is, uh, for, as from an investor's perspective, how this is a time for, you know, everyone to kind of sit back and, you know, do research. I feel like companies are not really launched like that, right? So you have to have some sort of like, you know, basic information, fundamental knowledge of what the area is that you're operating in or you want to operate in. So this might be a really good time to kind of, you know, do some research work, some groundwork on, you know, what you want to do and what the opportunities are. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And that actually speaks to what we're doing with our portfolio companies right now with Umbreen leading the charge in terms of research work that we're doing with them. Uh, Tinapa, sorry. Oh, just a, just a quick um, comment in addition to what Umbreen and Bijan said and also Munif said is that you know, this is kind of the world is going through a reset button at this point. And um, it's, um, it's, it gives us an opportunity um, for somebody who wants to start their own business or venture into something to first actually take time to reflect mm -hmm. and uh, to really do the homework, like Ambreen said. Do the research. Um, don't give up your dream, but use this time to do the groundwork and then, um, and then you move on with you know, whatever you want to do. And when you are thinking about what you want to do, you need to make sure that um, you know, this is something which is uh, commercially viable. Mm -hmm. It's something that is sustainable in post COVID world. I mean, and the opportunities are boundless. You know, the healthcare system, education, um, work behavior, everything is changing. So that is, what does that mean? That means that, you know, there is a way to, um, there is a business right there everywhere. So I, I'm just going to say that, you know, kind of in a more of a very um, uh, kind of pragmatic way. But I think that the most important thing is like Amrin said, you know, you have to do your homework. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is a huge opportunity and space for exactly. that. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're literally sitting at home, right? And you know, everybody else who are your potential customers are also sitting at home. So they probably have the space and the time to respond to surveys and questions. Um, yeah. I'm mindful of time. We have a minute left and I'm so sorry that we did not get to everyone's questions. Feel free to reach out to people on social media. How I want to um, end today um, is actually if someone can take away one thing of how you feel about the current environment and the future environment right now, what would that one thing be? And let's maybe hear from all the panelists. Um, so maybe starting with uh, Tina and then Manib, Bijan and Umbreen, um, and then we'll, we'll close the session. So um, Tina, you were saying some really great stuff. So if you want to kind of leave everybody with something to think about beyond what you just said, what would that be? Or is this on till 1030? Sorry, confused. No. We're ending in a, in a minute, right? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm a very, I'm an internally optimistic person. So I, I see that we are actually going to moving into one of the most innovative period of human history, um, where the whole world is going to think about how to do things in a new way. So um, that means, you know, it's actually going to be a positive world. There would be some bumps. But I see that, you know, it's going to be a better world. And what, what part would you play in it? That's what I would, that, that is the question I would leave with everybody. Great. Thank you. Manib? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I'd, I'd agree with Tina that I think that the world will become a better world. Also because now the rich also know that their money can't buy them health. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so they're going to be a lot nicer than they have been in the past. Right? Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, they will be supportive of anything that you build and invent, which is going to bring value uh, to people. So, so now's the time to do your research and work on, work on basically uh, your product uh, and build something which is going to be valuable for humanity. Great, thanks. Bijan? 
So I think uh, uh, as a founder, I know these are tough times, but you know, we have always uh, have to be optimistic. I think that's why we all started companies uh, at, at the go. So I think on a silver lining, we are getting to spend a lot of time with our families, those of who are fortunate enough. Uh, you know, uh, being in a month and a half now uh, with my family, uh, it's good. It's, it's tough at times to work, but that is uh, something that I take away. And um, I have met a lot of wonderful people. I think our team is working at home, putting in a lot of effort. I think even working a lot more than we did. We worked when it was uh, like in office. Uh, I have met wonderful people like Chinapa and a lot of startup founders. So I think these are takeaways and these are relationships we take into the post COVID-19 world. Like when we look back, I think our bonds will be much stronger because we can go and say, hey, we survived the COVID-19, remember? So next time we reach out to Calcium in 2021, we'll be, I think, <laughs> a lot closer because, you know, we survived yeah. the COVID-19 uh, together. So that's a bond I think we carry for the rest of our lives. And that's something I definitely look forward to as we come out of this pandemic to a better world. Yeah, thank you. And Breen? Yeah, I feel pretty much the same, I feel like. I definitely think that there, um, the digital transformation that we have been kind of needing for a long time it has happened pretty quickly during these days. And I really hope that it doesn't go back to what it was before the pandemic. Um, so that's one thing that's, you know, good, positive thing that's coming out of this. So people are much more open to these digital solutions and things like that, um, which obviously means that, you know, more people are kind of going to switch over to all of these different, you know, innovative solutions. Um, but at the same time, I think one major thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that, you know, a lot of people have lost their employment. Um, and just like everyone, I think, said um, today in this panel as well that, you know, a lot of the, those people who have lost their employment are from the very kind of, you know, lowest tier uh, socioeconomically, um, at least in Pakistan. So, you know, if uh, for this is for companies, I feel like, and I feel like any company that, you know, if the pandemic meant that they had to furlough their employees, um, I really, really do hope that they're being kind about it and they're really kind of building a good relationship and like, you know, sitting their employees down and really talking to them and try, kind of, you know, trying to explain the situation to them as opposed to kind of, you know, being really cold hearted about it. I feel like that's really important to kind of um, come out at, at the end of this pandemic kind of, you know, um, I, I really hope that that kind of, you know, stays intact. That's what I'm trying to say. But yeah, other than that, I feel like a lot of positive stuff is coming out of this and really hoping that we survive um, and thrive afterwards once this is over. Yeah. I have two things to leave you with. Uh, the very first thing is, um, and I'm speaking as an investor as well as someone that's built an accelerator program. Um, I think this is really an opportunity where the winners emerge in terms of people that, um, and winners not being in a very, like in that way that there's winners and losers, but ultimately um, what this space and this time really speaks to are people that are really adaptive and think on their feet right now. And I think we as both economies and both countries are actually really resilient as people. And I think that's one thing that's always inspiring about markets like ours is that just based on where we are in the world and, and what we've had to go through, um, our people tend to be very resilient anyway. And I think that speaks to the types of founders that we also produce. But this time is also a period for you to really think you know, quickly and to adapt quickly because um, that's what the environment is calling for right now. It's also as an investor, something that gets me excited is when I see founders that have really thought and thought quickly and adapted themselves and iterated their models um, really quickly. It's something that I find really impressive and it's been really exciting to see even with our portfolio companies um, currently as well as companies that are in our active pipeline, just watching how they've operated has been very inspiring to me. Um, and the second thing is because we are speaking to to our friends in Bangladesh. Um, there are so many things that technology has been able to do in this time, which is really have an opportunity to speak to players that are doing very similar things. And I've had the opportunity um, and the privilege of seeing how the Bangladeshi startup ecosystem, there's a sameness to what's happening in Pakistan in a lot of ways beyond what's happening in COVID-19, but startups that like Baikia, where we're seeing with, um, with Patao and Bangladesh, right? Like we're seeing very similar things with very similar unit economics and similar economies. So my hope and my call to action is for us to all think about how we can potentially collaborate together more um, in the future and learn from each other as well. So um, on that note, thank you guys so much for being part of this. Um, I know it's late over there, so um, stay safe and stay healthy, stay home. Um, and yeah, thank you. Good night.
Night. Bye.